Our next speaker is Trevor Scholz from New York City. He is associated professor at the New School for Culture and Media. And um, he is also author of several books and uh, essays about the internet as factory and playground. And in the next hour, he's going to talk about um, the opportunities and inequalities in digital labor and also about um, exploitation happening already on uh, crowdsourcing platforms like 99Digital, or Digital99, I'm not sure, or um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. So Trevor Scholz, it's yours. Please give him a welcome. So thank you for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, nach der Vorlesung, die in Englisch sein wird, uh, könnt ihr auch gerne in Deutsch Fragen stellen. Also verstehen tue ich das schon, nur wenn es zu uh, diesen Themen kommt, dann lieber in Englisch. Before the tsunami hits, you know how it is. The sea recedes, leaving a dead desert in which only cynicism and dejection remain. All you need to do is to make sure you have the right words to say, the right clothes to wear, before it finally wipes you away. At first glance, the situation in southern France and the United States seems to prove Franco Bifo Berardi right. The suicide rate in these parts of uh, Europe and in the US, especially among the middle-aged, has sharply increased during the time of the Great Depression that unfolded over the last uh, six years. Some people here in the audience may still remember the suicides of many East Germans when the Socialist Republic imploded. Incredible uh, precarious economic pressures lead to personal despair. But uh, precarity isn't an individual problem and such grand exit leaves no opportunity for alternative path. What is put to question by Berardi and also Peter Fleming and others is the possibility of alternative path, of a commons within capitalism, of digital labor that is worth defending. And we just heard about this from Nets Politik, of a commons within capitalism, of digital labor at startups that we should be building up and that of projects that we should invest in. And so what I want to do in the next 45 minutes or so is to make it abundantly clear where I found exploitative emerging forms of labor, but also talk about peer-to-peer -peer labor that is worth celebrating, investing in, and supporting. So to show you both sides of this landscape. Um, I will tell you, I just can't help it, but I become outraged about the way in which the blossoming industries uh, of the crowdsourcing industry are wiping away 100 years of labor struggle for the eight-hour workday, for paid vacation, health insurance, against child labor, from the Haymarket riots to the strike at the Ford River Rouge plant in 1945. All of this wiped away seemingly overnight by platforms like Mechanical Turk and others. My interventions range from a call of much needed new concept and theories to practical proposals. I'm offering all this from a position of an author, an artist, and an educator who is equally uh, interested in theory and in making stuff, making projects, starting projects. It was just uh, two weeks ago when we learned about Savar, Bangladesh, where five garment factories filled with workers who were paid 20 cents an hour and produced clothes for brands like Calvin Klein collapsed. When the building on Rama Plaza that housed these factories collapsed, the death toll soared to 517, immediately making this the biggest disaster in the history of the garment industry. The factory owner, who was warned about the lack of structural integrity of the building, was hiding cowardly in a suburb, and nobody really knows where Calvin Klein was that day or what he had to say about it. And here in Germany, even if it's not quite as bleak, you get a taste of this brave new world of labor that is literally killing people as well. 
Just think of the recent scandal at Amazon DE, which employed a security company named after Adolf Hitler's deputy Rudolf Hess to look after the 5,000 part-time workers, mostly with migration backgrounds in its biggest warehouse in Germany. There's just something unsettling about German guards with military haircuts, leather boots, and in tour Steiner designer in uniforms, telling workers from Bulgaria or Poland that they are the police around here, while blinding them with the headlights of their truck. It's of course part of good business uh, for Amazon to fire Hess security, but you know, let's not forget that it took German public television to make that happen. Interestingly, also Documenta now recalled strange experiences with Hess security. The Melbourne native company 99design doesn't really employ right-wing radicals, but uh, one of its three headquarters is in Berlin, and the company is very active in the German design market. 99design offers competitive crowdsourcing for designers. Currently, the company has a pool of 200,000 registered designers. So, for example, if you are a client who is looking for a logo, you might spend the very reasonable sum of $300, and for that, you receive 116 completely executed design, as the designer and researcher Florian Schmidt explained. But of these 116 designs, only one will receive payment, and it's a payment of $180. And I'm not sure if I have to spell this out, but uh, that means that 115 designers worked for free, and we are not paid at all. And you don't have to be a math genius to understand that this means that $120 went to the intermediary, the company that connects workers with those who are looking for work, 99designs. 99designs states that it ran 180,000 of those crowdsourced competitions that are, of course, global in nature. Not only do wages hit rock bottom, but degrees in design, decades of experience, reputation, uh, and of course, the costs itself are cut out of the equation and any talented students in a dorm room uh, in an art college in Shanghai is now competing for the same job. Uh, what it means to be a designer then has completely changed. But those who think that uh, working conditions don't matter in the social democracy that is Germany should also meditate on the 400,000 academic student assistants who are either underpaid or not paid at all. They live on the hope that things will turn out for the better one day, and if they don't, well, then they already got used to the precariousness of their work life. In corporate America and academia, the equivalent is the unpaid student intern. Ross Perlin, a professor at NYU, estimated that unpaid student internships generated financial benefit for corporate America of about $2 billion a year. But it is true, if compared to other countries like China, India, Russia, and the United States, Germany is at least thus far less affected by the dark side of digital labor. But nobody should say that precarious digital labor doesn't exist in Germany. And let's not make a mistake about it. Worldwide, for millions of people, digital environments have become their daily grind and yet are invisible to us. So they are, we don't see these workers, they don't see each other, they don't see their employer. And uh, we need to give a face to these work practices. So I think it is incredibly important to make those work practices visible. Employers have become linguistic spinmeisters that make up all kinds of interesting new words, including requesters, task rabbits, cloud workers, one of my favorites, pro uh, providers, and crowd workers just to make sure that they're not thought of as employers and to make you forget that this is actually work and not just a game that you play instead of watching television. They might have even taken a cue from the German term Arbeitgeber, which is really equally turning work reality on its head. If I call you a cloud worker, you are still a worker and your stomach will, gil will still get hungry come lunchtime and your eyes will still feel strained and your back might hurt after long screen-bound hours. And you're also a citizens, citizen with some rights that come with that. You're not just a cloud worker. The deceptive language used by many of these companies is aiming to make you forget all that and suggest that something completely new is happening here. 
In many cases, however, digital labor continues traditional sweatshop economies. And I don't say that easily. I mean it by the word. We can talk about that later. This deceptive language game is also important for the legal advisors of these companies who know how important it is to call their workers employees, <coughs> not to call their workers employees, because employees have rights, such as minimum wage standards, paid vacation, health insurance. They are independent contractors, they say, and while this is an assertion that has never been tested in any court, it is also a convenient position to allow them not to take care of their workers while still getting, as filmmaker Alex Rivera put it in his brilliant film, Sleep Dealer, all the work without the worker. In 2009 at the New School in New York City, I convened one of the first large conferences on digital labor. The New School, I don't know if you know it, uh, has a fairly widely known history of critical theory with professors like Hannah Arendt, but it's also known for its student activism. In 2007, when I started uh, to think about these issues and put together the conference, uh, it was one year into the mounting financial crisis, and it struck me that the people spending time on social networking services like MySpace, if you remember that, uh, are contributing to the spiraling wealth of the hectomillionaires of Silicon Valley, and that we might want to consider such value-generating activity as labor. The event included uh, Tiziana Terranova, Andrew Ross, Jody Dean, jo Jonathan Zittrain, Lisa Lacamora, Mackenzie Walk, and many others, all of whom played an important role in shaping the foundation of this discourse. There was talk of the new hacker class, there was talk about racial slurs against gold farmers in World of Warcraft, uh, and the economy of mompreneurs, and crowdsourcing research and development on platforms like Innocentive and others. In the meantime, I should say, a conference in Sweden focused on digital labor, and also now there's a very noticeable acceleration of events about the topic, and also scholars who start uh, and many, many scholars start writing about this avant-garde of post-Fordism with platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk. Dana Boyd blogged yesterday about the topic. Much of this discussion is really coming to terms with what labor actually means in this context of the internet and to somehow account for one very important factor, which is the blurring of work and life. This came up at several talks this morning already. Uh, the blurring of work and life, leisure and labor, play and work. Other central questions of this discussion include also the capture of value, the continued validity of Marx's theory of sur surplus value, and the question of exploitation and the politics of time. But before uh, we jump into that, I want to define digital labor for you and then show you a map of the digital labor landscape that I created, which should make uh, it clear that totalizing accounts of these emerging uh, work environments can only lead to misrepresentation. So I think we have to be uh, quite specific about it. So this is the first attempt uh, at somehow narrowing this down, but also accounting to uh, at what is different in this digital labor realm than in traditional labor. Uh, so a human activity that is uh, undertaken solely for pleasure that has uh, sometimes undertaken solely for pleasure that has economic and symbolic value and can be performed at any time. It's of course not bound to the factory, the office, or the household, and it can be performed constantly, uh, as many of you do as we are speaking now on your cell phones. Leisure, work, leisure and work are enmeshed beyond recognition. Out of this landscape uh, of digital labor, and I gave it a shot here by trying to think of the different kinds of uh, paid, uh, waged digital labor that I can think of. And I'm just gonna talk about this tiny little bit because I'm gonna give you two examples really today. So I, I will leave out obviously uh, most of this uh, discussion, but just point you to one example really first in this area, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. How many of you are familiar with Mechanical Turk? A few, wow, so many not, okay, good. So uh, I'm putting a screenshot up here. 
Uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk is an online crowdsourcing system founded in 2005, designed for corporate labor management. Uh, Mechanical Turk is based on the idea that certain tasks are easy to perform for people, but difficult or impossible to execute for computers. Currently, there are 500,000 people registered uh, with Mechanical Turk. Sure, not everybody will be active all the time, and, um, but still, if you, it's a significant number uh, of workers, especially if you compare this to the compensated workforce of Google, which is uh, 54,000 people, or that of Craigslist, which is 23 people. Amazon Mechanical Turk, which Amazon calls an artificial, artificial intelligence service, allows for our projects to be broken down into thousands of bits, which are then assigned as individual tasks to so-called crowd workers. Here comes the beautiful language. To assign captions for 3,000 images, you could hire 3,000 workers. So it's probably fairly obvious. Uh, so if, you, if I hire one of you and ask you to uh, whatever, put captions on 3,000 images, I will have to pay you more than if I pay 3,000 people to do just one of those images and I pay them one cent each for that task. That's the logic behind the, this way of operating. Individual workers do, know what they are, do not know what they are working on or whom they are no, working for. So employers don't know who is actually sitting there and neither do you. It's anonymous. And also, you have no idea what you're working on. So you are given a task, you execute it, it is never explained to you what you are doing. A study by Lily Irani showed that over 50% of the workers live in the United States, and some 32% reside in India. The rest is spread all over the world. In the United States, the average age of the workers is 31 years old, and most of them are female. A very large number of them is unemployed. In India, workers are predominantly male and are on average younger, some 25 years old. The Indian workers have higher level of education than their American counterparts, with 74% of them having a college degree. Many of you will, will know that the inspiration for the name Mechanical Turk came from this chess-playing automaton designed in 1769 that allowed a small-bodied chess player hidden in a wooden box to control the Mechanical Turks of a hand. It was a major hit in, in Europe, admired by the likes of Charles Babbage and Edgar Allan Poe. Mechanical Turk workers are not merely toiling for money, and that's important. So not everybody who's working on these environments is actually doing it for the money. Some people say they are doing it to kill time or learn English. Uh, and then there's a, 18 a group of 18% of uh, workers on this platform that are actually there to make a living. And they think of it as a full-time job, which is practically impossible as even experienced mechanical Turk workers make an average of $2 an hour. $2 an hour. So it is without much hesitation that I'm referring to this work on mechanical Turk as exploitation on the ground of underpayment and total alienation. So alienation based on the fact that the identity of the employer is unknown and that the nature of the project that they are working on is unknown to the workers as well. You can add to that that workers are isolated from each other, and to fully appreciate the aspiration of the small number, or the desperation of the small number of workers who treat Mechanical Turk as a full-time job, listen to one quote from a worker. He says, I realize that I have a choice to work or not to work on Mechanical Turk, uh, but that means I would also not need to make a choice to eat or not to eat, or pay bills or not pay bills. So you hear, through these words, and there are many of those, the desperations of workers who can't find employment. Desperation drives people into knowingly, knowingly into these exploitative uh, situations. There are some scholars that have said, you know, well, these people would never do this if they see it's exploitative, but that's completely wrong, you know. Of course, you have also a mom with uh, three kids working four jobs, not because she is too stupid to see that she's exploited, but because she is desperate for the money, right? So, desperation drives people into knowingly exploitative, not knowingly into exploitative situations. So, but not all workers will agree that they are exploited. They may even say that they are doing it by choice. 
So who then is really responsible for their plight? Whether or not we want to accuse them of a false consciousness, as in you just don't know that you are exploited, as uh, academics love to do it, uh, we shouldn't forget to ask who created the conditions and also ask who created these conditions that put people in such a desperate situation in the first place and that make it so difficult for them to turn around and turn away from such self-exploitation. For employers, however, it's quite a sweet deal. Uh, they have access to a 24-7 workforce on demand. They remain anonymous and only pay if they are satisfied with the results, but they don't even have to do that. So Amazon explicitly permits them to not pay workers and still use the work. That's in their term of service. Corporations feel emboldened that they can skirt minimum wage legislation, $2 an hour, um, in the completely deregulated arena of the internet. So what you can see here is that the rules of this environment are heavily tilted towards the employers. Amazon claims impartiality when it comes to any kind of labor dispute. They say, well, we are just offering you the platform. What's happening on there has nothing to do with us. They prefer to be neutral bystanders when, in fact, they choreograph this rote, repetitive, and potentially exploitative situations. To put it crudely, they just want to sack in the profits, but don't want to hear about the very real problems of the human beings who are working facilitated through their service. In his book, The Mass Ornament, Krakauer discussed the Tiller Girls, which uh, were artificially produced in the United States and then exported uh, to Europe to demonstrate the greatness of American production. I don't know if you've ever seen like a YouTube video of them. Um, and they, the ever-repeating and perfectly synced motions of their routines suggested hyper-efficiency of the assembly line, Ford's assembly line. But in comparison to the workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk, the Tiller girls seem really like long-haired anarchic hippies. Is Amazon Mechanical Turk more like a nine-inch nails of our time, tunes made up of tiny bits sampled from existing albums? The Mechanical Turk workers are logging on to the web website and pick from a large number of tasks, like tagging and labeling images, the transcription of audio or video recordings, or the categorization of products, all of which are usually paid uh, only a few cents per task. Click workers are sitting in cyber cafes or in their homes, pursuing their toil as if it were a pastime. Work becomes quite game-like in this context, which has led German media theorist Julian Kücklich to call this playbook in a different context. What uh, we can see in, the con in this context is uh, this process that is hyped so much, and I'm sure people will talk about at this uh, event as well, of gamification, as part of which principles of gaming, uh, let's say the mechanics that help to release the addictive energy when playing Angry Birds, is now applied to work tasks. Of course, Mechanical Turk has little to do with the smiling Tiller girls in Krakauer's Mars ornament. It is far more alike to the loveless, endlessly polished, and ultimately hollow professionalism of the stage acts by Justin Bieber. I don't know if any of you went to the O2 concert, if you have 12-year-old children, maybe. Um, okay, so Peter Fleming and Carl Sederström likened the click workers to the walking dead in the popular TV series of the same name. They call this zombie labor. Others think of the dawn of the dead and let all of their Marxian association of vampiric labor flow freely. People who were using labor services offered by Mechanical Turk are frequently unaware of the unacknowledged invisible workers who were providing these services. They might be familiar with the company that delivers the services, but they don't actually know who's doing the work. You may know this uh, 1935 poem by Bertolt Brecht, where the evening the wall of China was finished, did the masons go? In the books, you will find the name of kings. So what we have here is a really a continuation. The workers on Mechanical Turk are even less traceable than these Chinese masons and that Brecht mentioned, right? It is the likes of the Mechanical Turk workers who are splitting the bill for the global recession. 
So in conclusion about Mechanical Turk, I want to say that it offers workers a non-competitive, flexible environment that they can easy, easily enter into and exit out of, an environment where they can work no matter where they live, with some disclaimers. This is also a work environment that, takes, that makes discrimination quite difficult, let's say based on gender, race, or ethnicity, because it's, employers don't really know who is on the other side, right? They don't really know who is working for them. On the downside, work is predominantly below minimum wage. It is basically impossible to make a full-time living as a Turker. And Mechanical Turk is deceptive and ethically questionable. For companies, it is advantageous because they don't need managers or human rights, uh, human rights, yeah, they should have human rights resources, human resource departments. The participation agreement that workers have to sign indubitably favors them over the workers, and the pay is low, uh, and the volume of the work is very high. So there is no commitment to the worker at all. On the other hand, there, there are concern about the abuse of intellectual property rights by companies when workers handle even small pieces of particular projects and the quality of the work on Mechanical Turk is sometimes unpredictable. So, now we are arriving at a, a turning point. I hope at this point that at least with this example, uh, you will agree with me that there are some instances of exploitation, or you will at least, I hope, agree that this is an instance of exploitation. And um, simply on the fact of underpayment and alienation. So, but now let me turn to something much more complicated, which is unwaged digital labor. So, here I am uh, mapped this a little bit so you can see that the wonderful work that is done for NetsPolitik, all this volunteering and uh, the uh, volunteer efforts that go into creating this amazing site, right, or these amazing resources that are unpaid, are public spirited, right? They are there for you to sit here and actually know more about NetsPolitik, right? So there's clearly a good side of digital labor because, you know, we would want to see more of that. We want to see people editing Wikipedia, we want to see people participating in Folded or in Ushahidi or other examples uh, that uh, we could bring in this gigantic landscape of um, unwaged digital labor. But here again, I will also pick one example. I put an unmistakable arrow there. Uh, and so, and we'll only talk about that. My initial map should have clarified that my taxonomy of digital labor takes account of the peculiarities of a broad range of practices. So here again, just one specific case, and I will talk about Ariana Huffington's Huffington Post. Are you familiar with Huffington Post? Who is? Yes, almost all of you. And here she is. Together with Kenneth Lara, Andrew Breitbart, and Jonna Peretti, uh, Ariana Huffington founded the site as an umbrella for left-leaning commentary in 2005. The simple idea was to draw attention to existing content by aggregating it from various blogs and add some original text to that mix. The site started featuring uh, bloggers who Huffington appreciated and also managed to attract posts by then Senator Barack Obama and celebrities like Oprah. This, combinations, this combination, the game plan clearly was, would increase the social capital of the bloggers who would remain happy campers despite never being remunerated for their work. This recipe succeeded until 2011 when dark clouds started to move into the land of Huffington Post. That year, Ariana Huffington um, and her initial investors turned around on their writers and sold the company to AOL for $350 million. So thousands of bloggers who contributed to this project because they liked Ayanna Huffington and they liked the politics on the side, let's say, were left in the cold. So basically, suddenly, their work contributed to the personal wealth of $350 million of Ayanna Huffington. They didn't find this very amusing. Uh, not only was this... Um, not only was this an obvious affront to the writers, but Huffington was also extremely blasé about her response to the outrage of the bloggers. She just basically said, oh, go ahead, go on strike. And she did, they did. 
Uh, in February 2011, Visual Arts Source, which has frequently cross-posted cross material on Huffington Post, started to boycott the site. One month later, the strike and call to boycott was joined and endorsed by the National Writers' Union and the Newspaper Guild of America. And in April 2011, the labor rights advocate Jonathan Tassini filed a class action lawsuit for $105 million in back wages for the thousands of uncompensated writers. So the call for boycott wasn't especially successful, and the class action lawsuit was lost. You know, the bloggers had never signed anything that would promise them payment. So it turned out that making money off the backs of these writers, of these bloggers, was not illegal. But in my opinion, however, it was highly unethical and de deserves our condemnation and perhaps even our boycott of the site as in not reading it. Huffington is an interesting example because this writing for exposure is often cited by publishers and, and journals when they are trying to explain why they are not paying for their writers or for their academic speakers, or you add your own example here. The broad landscape of digital uh, work also includes student internships that are increasingly conducted through the internet. So now they don't even sit anymore in the office of Vogue magazine or you name it. Uh, now these uh, can also be conducted online. Customer service work it is performed for, on sites like Apple on, and Verizon. And yes, also our cognitive labor on Facebook, Reddit, LinkedIn, and Google. In short, the argument is that what we are becoming, according to Dallas Smythe, is really an audience commodity. We are captured, our data are collected, analyzed, and sold, which allows advertising companies to profile us, make predictions about our future likes, and to market us in a more personalized and customized way. We are indeed generating value through our presence and activities, through our daily routines, and through our sociality. And if you are not paying for a service, chances are that you are the product. We are putting in emotional labor to fit into the institutional context and communal values of Facebook, for example. We are recreating our identity online and on corporate platforms, and we are more than generous with our time, time that we are taking away from other activities, from our loved ones, from working on alternative projects. If you compare this cognitive labor, of course, to the work of the 1.2 million Foxconn employees in Shenzhen or the miners of rare earth in Congo, we can note first of all that um, they are the basis for our digital lifestyle, for all these wonderful Mac products that you have in front of you. And I would hesitate to call us filling in a recapture or spending time at Facebook, or farm will exploitation just in the same way as these Foxconn workers are exploited. But I do think that there is a violence of participation taking place and that people are used and expropriated. So I think that there is a distinction to be made here. In this section, this next section, short section, I will combine examples of public-spirited work and then already move on to some proposals. Not so much proposals in the sense of, here, this is what you should do, but more proposals, again, as sort of provocations and things that we can start thinking about together and maybe it translates into projects. So I will talk about the digital labor that I'm happy to give away for free with some proposals for action. It doesn't need much explanation when I say that working for Wikipedia, OpenStreetMap, Science Commons, Folded, NASA's ClickWorkers, Challenge.org, Distributed Proofreaders, or eBird, or NetsPolitik, uh, is not the same like working for Facebook. Now, I want to turn and see how we can support this kind of work that is public-spirited, and we would like to see more of. And on the other hand, I would like to see how we can restrict the kind of work that we would like to see less of. And our contributions will, of course, be only partial, and they will also take time. So first of all, we need better theories and concepts to critically understand emerging forms of labor. So I'm thinking of Jody Dean's communicative capitalism, 
Mario Tronti's Social Factory, describing how small acts of labor are not just taking place in the factory anymore, but really all throughout society. Carlo Vecellone's uh, rent extraction, and so on. These are crucial starting points, but much further work has to be done to make sense of the complete capture of life, uh, where all parts of life really becoming a standing reserve for capital. Second, I think that the building of alternative infrastructures is incredibly important. You know those projects, uh, Freedom Box, GNU Social, Friendica, Crabgrass, to account for their, for their technical functioning is critical. And many people are tied up with creating more and more of these alternative social networking sites, alternative structures, and they are important. But at the same time, I think we don't always need yet another alternative social network. I think that the problems are technical, but they are not only technical. And there are dozens of alternative projects already out there, but they are underutilized because they didn't manage to attract sufficient number of users. Think of the destiny or uh, the history, really, of diaspora, for example, the supposed uh, Facebook alternative, or the, the place where we all hoped would be the alternative to Facebook. But now, until this day, I have maybe five friends on that site, right? And I'm probably of all of these platforms. I have accounts on all of them, and my contacts there stretch to five or six or seven contacts each. And that's not my fault of trying. <laughs> so Charlie recently proposed to dedicate the same amount of money that we give to corporate services like internet service providers, and so on, to public and alternative projects. So maybe uh, the team at Nets Politics should really say, well, hey, you know, just appeal to people and say, you're spending so much for your internet service provider, S spend the same amount on us. One project that I would like to support with this talk is the German Phenopoly.de, which will launch very soon, offering an internet marketplace that is based on cooperative principles emphasizing transparency and ethical treatments of the workers and the clients. They already attracted some 900 members, and for 50 euros, you can become a member too. It doesn't seem to be entirely clear what it would take to lure our friends away from existing fat cat powers of the social web. What would it take to feed the desires and to distill and reawaken values that would move them away from being agents of machines for self-promotion and consumption? Sites like Phenopoly, alongside one of the pioneers of the internet, Craigslist, are inspiring examples. I'm uh, calling Craigslist uh, in a greed-free business because, I don't know if you know this, they could make uh, $500 million a year if they would introduce advertising. And uh, so if you look at the editors of the Wall Street Journal, they just bang their head against the wall and really cannot understand why if you have the chance to make this money, why don't you do it? And Craig Newmark's answer is quite simple. He says he knows when enough is enough. And he also said that users didn't ask for advertising. So he made a poll on the site and he asked them, do you want advertising? And they said, no, we do not want advertising. Thus, $500 million remain unmade. So, Craigslist is, well, it's profitable, but it doesn't maximize profits, right? And so I think this could be a real inspiration for startups, uh, especially at this event. I think if there would be, if there are businesses that are data driven, I think the Craigslist model is quite a model that uh, one could run with. And I think you would get a lot of goodwill from people, as you can see with Panopoly already. Third, I want to propose an expropriation literacy that addresses the questions of withdrawal, refusal, and disidentification. Here I would like to stay, take a stand against an all-out withdrawal, a nihilistic radical no to everything related to computers and the internet. I think that is deeply elitist as a proposal. Who can afford to do this? Like, whoever proposes that, I wonder if they have a job or if they have to worry about their job. I think, but I am in favor, very much so, of selective engagement in the social web to really think what we refuse. So a selective refusal, a selective withdrawal, I think makes all the sense in the world. Rather than opting out altogether, we should find new forms of solidarity to change things. This one encouraging example where Amazon, there is actually already one and more than one, 
uh, encouraging example where Amazon Mechanical Turk workers now can jointly evaluate employers, making it easier to avoid especially abusive companies on Mechanical Turk. It's called Turkopticon, it's a Firefox plugin, you can also plug it into Chrome, and basically allows workers to share uh, the, their eval an evaluation of particular employers, and you can track the history of these otherwise anom anonymous employers, and it creates also a commonality among the workers, which are completely anonymous otherwise. So, also here, I also should say that this is a project by Lily Irani and her team. Also here as Republica, there's uh, Joel uh, Duroy, who is working with the German freelancer movement and trying to unionize them. I understand that he's speaking on stage three right after this talk, so go check him out. He's a great guy, great project. If all of this organizing seems exceedingly difficult to do, if unionization of a transnational temporary workforce sounds impossible, then we might want to check in with the history and learn that Cesar Chavez managed to unionize the migrant workers in the fields of California by introducing consumer boycotts. If Chavez was able to unionize, why shouldn't it succeed in the emerging environment of digital labor too? Last, and this concludes my talk, I propose to expand jurisdiction of federal labor law to clearly include new work environments online. So you may say, oh God, this is an entirely American issue, what do we have to do with this? I do not think so. This is not a US-centric argument. Most of the large intermediaries, in fact, are located in the US, right? Their headquarters are in the US, Amazon, Google, you name it and uh, Facebook, and which means that they are falling under American uh, labor law. An explicit application of the Fair Labor Standards Act to the internet and enforcement of that application, much more important, an enforcement of that application, would have significant ramification far beyond the borders of the US. Currently, there is a, there are, is a lawsuit here and there uh, one lawsuit currently is brought against uh, CrowdSpring, one of the uh, crowdsourcing companies, and it, uh, one worker there asserts that the company should have paid minimum wages and acknowledge him as an employee rather than an independent contractor. Such a change of the wage floor for crowdsourcing companies, should this be successful, could alter the entire international landscape of the crowdsourcing industry. Equally to, related to this question of a valid legal response is the establishment of an association that can represent this internationally distributed digital workforce, handle disputes, inform, inform them of their rights, and ser serve as a central coordination place for campaigns. Thank you very much. So of course we can have this discussion uh, on Twitter, you see my handle there, uh, but we can uh, also have it here, wenn ihr wollt, auch in Deutsch. <laughs> Und äh, mir wurde gesagt, dass wenn ihr Fragen habt, dann solltet ihr da irgendwie euch ein Mikrofon nehmen, weil das natürlich alles äh, aufgezeichnet wird und äh, was immer ihr auch sagt, dann für die nächsten zehn Jahre äh, abrufbar sein wird äh, im Internet oder länger. Okay, so hier ist jemand mit einer Frage. Ich glaube, da ist, da ist ein Mikrofon da hinten. Da müssen Sie den ganzen Weg zurückgehen. Ja. Um, you kind of raised the question about solidarity and unionizing. And I was wondering, Joseph Mitchell Turk, but there are many examples where like protest movements failed. For example, Spackwatch. So they tried to track all the 99 designs incident, but they failed. So, what do you think, how long it's going to take that the movement's going to form and how strong they're going to be and does it need more coordination with like real unions in the real world? So, what's, what's really going on and could you get more in detail on that? Well, I can tell you uh, about this one example that we already have, which is Tarkopticon, right? So, it's uh, relatively successful. They have, uh, I think, 7,000 uh, people created accounts on this. I don't know if you understood this. So, Tarkopticon is this... Um, this is an, uh, um, a plug for this tool. Um, so 
what you do is basically you download this and you uh, insert it into uh, Firefox, and it then, when you are going to Amazon Mechanical Turk, it, uh, and you look at particular tasks, then you can see which company, what their track record is, right? Their track record in terms of how much do they answer to their workers if they have complaints. For example, in the case of uh, rejections of work, which happens frequently, right? So work is rejected, but the companies never tell people why they reject the work. Uh, and they can uh, say if the company offers a fair payment, if the workers think that this is fair, and so on. And so this is just a real life example that is joined by many people that are actually working on the site and I'm sure making their uh, work life a whole lot easier. Right? So there's a concrete example of this, uh, how, how this could actually look like. And the way they went about it is that they first interviewed lots and lots of the workers and asked them, well, what do you actually want? So not to come from this position of, I am the organizer and I will now tell you what's important to you, but actually to research very carefully what was important to them. So one of the things was uh, delayed payment. If you have any freelancer here, you will know the problem. Uh, and, uh, and so on, right? So, and then to basically rate companies by that uh, margin. It's incredibly difficult. I mean, it's an atomized, anonymous workforce that is only working temporarily and all over the world. But like I said, you know, we should really sort of mobilize some uh, energy around this and enthusiasm in a healthy degree uh, to really try to make uh, this work in lots of different incarnations. One legal scholar suggested, for example, to whenever you, uh, for whoever uh, feels that they can afford this or do this, to sue these companies for minimum wage and for being recognized as an employee. And uh, if there are, they will probably, most of these lawsuits will probably fail, uh, but maybe there is one judge that will just rule a little bit different, and this may change the whole landscape tremendously. Hi. Yeah, that's not a question. Um, I was just wondering, you said that um, if you're not paying for a service, the chances are you're the product. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about Creative Commons and the idea of you know, people creating content for free, putting it out for free. How does that relate to that service, or is that, or is that different? Well, I think that the IP debate, the, inter the intellectual uh, property debate, is not at the center of, the, of what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It's uh, because the, uh, let's say, companies like uh, Google and let's say Facebook, I mean, Facebook doesn't really care what you post, right? They don't care if you post your poem and if that is a fantastic poem. It's not like they want to take your poem and sell it. But what they do want is people pay attention to you and be grouped around you and have social connections. It is about activity, about attention, and about the data trace that all of this activity leaves behind and that, they, that can be analyzed, right? So in this sense, uh, uh, it's the same if you think of Second Life, right? Second Life, uh, I don't know if you still remember, that's sort of the MySpace of virtual worlds. Um, if you go in there, there's hardly anybody there anymore. But uh, all little, every single little leaf that you see in there, every little wave of water or every little crumb that you see is resident generated, right? It's the, the, the people who came in. I was one of the first. I taught a class when uh, in Second Life uh, with two classes on various campuses and we used these 3D building tools uh, when it came out. And it was a completely empty field, right? There was nothing. So everything that is in there is generated by users, which makes it an... Uh, an attractive experience. The wealth of the material that is there makes it attractive, right? So, and then uh, uh, Linden Labs decided to turn over the intellectual property to the residents. They say, you own your material, which of course means very little because for them, it doesn't really matter who owns it, right? If you own it or they own it, it's not like you take your castle from Second Life and you bring it home or something. So I think these IP issues, um, uh, are, of course, always part of this discussion, but I don't think that they are at the heart of it. Well, for you, it seems to be very clear what work should be paid for and what not. Mm -hmm. So what is, in your opinion, work that creates value and should be paid for, and which isn't? 
That's a very good question. Well, there, are, there were experiments in Germany, uh, I don't know if you know this, with Wikipedia to pay Wikipedia ed editors out of state government funds. Right? And uh, they found in Germany, and there are many examples, and there's this famous essay about kindergartens uh, in a kibbutz in Israel, where they found basically that money isn't always a solution. So paying people can actually demotivate them. Surprise, surprise. Uh, in particular context. So if you say that, well, your Wikipedia contribution is worth $5, when you think of yourself giving a $500 contribution but doing it for free, uh, demotivates you, right? So the role of money there is, uh, is interesting. Uh, well, I mean, I think I'm really concerned with, like I told you, these particular instances that I told you, that I showed you, and I just think that they should introduce the labor standards that are existing in the real world should be reflected in the world, also in the internet world, right? I mean, what is different in terms of bringing food to the table, of you working in an office or working at your startup or wherever you work, to somebody working online for Amazon or for another company, right? I mean, they are working, they're doing work. So, but somehow online it is okay. It's a completely, it's, com it's okay to completely underpay people. To not even, so the most basic, the most basic rights, right, that the worker has, not, let's say, in the United States, this is not ex especially voluptuous uh, in terms of the kind of rights that uh, workers have, but they have basic rights. They have a right to minimum wage uh, and, uh, you know, let's say, uh, paid sick days and, and so on. And none of this exists. And this just makes me furious. It really outrages me. And I wonder if this, uh, uh, you can relate to this. I mean, it really makes me very angry that people worked for 100 years, you know, there are people like who died for this stuff, you know, and who died for the eight-hour workday, who died for minimum wages, who died to fight against child labor, and now on Amazon Mechanical Turk you have child labor because you don't know who's working there, right? It's completely anonymous. So I think this is sort of like my strongest uh, uh, punch here, maybe that I want to give. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, hello. Um, hello. In der Informatik ähm, werden, ist eine, ein eine besonderes Thema, ist ähm, äh, große Datenmengen automatisch zu kategorisieren und äh, in der Forschung braucht man äh, Testdatensätze, um sozusagen Algorithmen zu entwickeln für solche automatische äh, right. Kategorisierung. Und ich habe mitbekommen, an meiner Universität werden mechanische oh, sure. Türken yeah. benutzt, yeah, yeah, klar. um solche auch. Datensätze zu erzeugen. Ist das moralisch okay, insbesondere für Universitäten, solche äh, Dienste in Anspruch zu nehmen. Ja, also ich äh, rate meinen Studen äh, Studenten davon ab, aber mir ist es natürlich auch äh, bewusst, dass viele das machen. Und äh, äh, da, da kommen natürlich ganz viele äh, Probleme damit äh, dann rein. Da gibt es, weiß nicht, in den USA muss man immer äh, solche äh, äh, Dokumente unterschreiben, dass äh, jedes Mal die, die, die sicherstellen, dass niemand... Ähm, eine Gewalt angetan wird in irgendeiner Art und Weise in der Studie zum Beispiel. Ne? Und äh, ich wäre mir nicht sicher, wie, sage mal, wenn ein Student zu mir kommen würde und die müssten das mit mir unterschreiben und ich müsste dagegen zeichnen, äh, ob ich das unterschreiben würde, weil äh, mir halt die Arbeitsbedingungen natürlich bewusst sind. Aber auf der anderen Seite könntest du es natürlich auch weniger äh, einseitig sehen und sagen, dass es kommt halt darauf an, was du bezahlst auf Mechanical Turk. Das, niemand stoppt dich natürlich, äh, den Minimum Wage zu bezahlen. Ne? Naja, die Idee ist schon, das so billig wie möglich zu bekommen, weil die Datenmengen ja. wirklich enorm ja. sind. Da bist du nicht alleine, ja. Mhm. ja. Ich denke, es ernst ist Noch eine Frage, ja? Ja, hallo, trau dich. Uh, is it all right? Do we still have time? Ich, I don't know, sure. Huh? Five uh, min minutes. And uh, my question, I'm not sure if it's a question, but there was one case, uh, a couple of Japanese CEO of a huge IT company said that um, in the context of creating a logo design for their company, they, did, they said like, oh, we don't pay designers, we can crowdsource it. And the problem with the digital label is that you don't see the slaves, you don't see the masters, but you are exploited somewhere in between there. And however, uh, NGOs or NPOs or startup companies, they have fewer resources and we have to depend on those labors somewhere we don't see but who likes to do it but not being paid for it. And I wonder 
like how do you balance in between those kind of ethics and uh, yeah. trying to gain uh, popularity? Maybe that's part of this expropriation literacy, right? The question is like maybe, uh, and this discussion needs to be had much more, right? Which is a discussion really about values, right? In this constantly changing landscape uh, and this dramatic crisis that we are in, uh, economic crisis, you know, what are actually values that you are hold on to and that you are, that you are willing to defend when, um, you know, amidst these rapids? And uh, this is maybe a question that an NGO uh, should ask themselves as well, right? Uh, one little question. Isn't it at least a problem of ownership? Because there are um, the big companies who give you, um, as a user, the, to, uh, the attractive tools on their own channels um, they provide, and um, they also um, defend about the, uh, over the concurrence. And you, as a user, um, you haven't got the possibility to, uh, to work against um, those companies on an effective way, uh, yes, on an effective way, like Facebook or Google. You haven't uh, a real choice to avoid those um, guys. Yeah, well, I guess this is this question uh, of refusal. So I think, I mean, I don't have any, uh, you know, one to three step uh, kind of recipe here, but. Uh, but I think to think about this sort of selective engagement and to diversify, decentralize uh, your presence and to really try to include uh, those alternatives, some of which I named, uh, in your online reality, I think is, is one part. And then also to really, uh, you know, once you sort of have an understanding of these issues, to really link this to campaigns, to, to actual sort of political issues, to link this to Occupy or other movements, you know. Uh, and uh, try to sort of think about where your own politics of technology really lies. I think uh, uh, it touches on these issues. It's a larger discussion, you know, that we sh can have afterwards about withdrawal, disidentification, etc. Yeah. Na, wenn ihr noch eine Frage habt, dann ist jetzt eure letzte Chance, oder? Die, die Idee, ein großes Problem oder eine große Aufgabe in ganz viele kleine Einzelteile zu zerteilen und dann zu verteilen, ist etwas Großartiges. Wir werden nie Raumschiffe bauen können, wenn wir, also wo ja. wir von der Erde weg können, wenn wir das nicht können. Gibt es genau. irgendwelche theoretische Konzepte, wie man diese kleinen Aufgaben und die Bewertung und die Bezahlung dafür irgendwie berechnen kann? Berechnen kann. Es gibt mehrere Theorien. Ich weiß nicht, ob du Ted Nelson kennst. Der hat... Hypertext erfunden ne? oder Hypermedia, Hypertext. Äh, und äh, er hatte halt, äh, ich glaube, es war 1969, äh, die Idee, äh, dass, basic, dass das Internet ganz anders aussehen sollte. Er hat das, oder was dann das World Wide Web wurde, Internet, wurde, Internet dann World Wide Web wurde, äh, hat er hat dieses Project Xanadu was er da erfunden hat, wo er 30 Jahre gearbeitet hat und was nie funktioniert hat. Und da hatte er halt schon 1969 eine Idee dafür, wie Leute bezahlt werden sollten für ihre Arbeit. Und zwar hat er sich vorgestellt, dass äh, wenn du eine Zeitung liest, äh, dann liest du doch nur den ersten Paragraph oft. Heute besonders. Er hat es gerade äh, updated das on his blog. Also er, er, er denkt da immer noch drüber nach. Und äh, Du sollst halt nur bezahlen für das, was du auch wirklich liest. Das heißt, dass der Rest des Internets ausgeblockt ist, solange du es an, bis du es anklickst. Und in dem Moment, wo du es anklickst, aber nur in kleinen Segmenten, dann bezahlst du einen Bruchteil von einem Cent dafür, der dann überwiesen wird, automatisch. Und das ganze Internet oder das ganze Netzwerk, wie er sich das vorstellte, sollte darauf basiert sein. War natürlich total unpraktisch, also sehr schwer in Realität umzusetzen. Ja. Aber das ist vielleicht ein Modell dessen, wo jemand da schon sehr genau darüber nachgedacht hat, wie, wie man diese, diese sort of Finanzflüsse umsteuern könnte. Gut, wenn ihr jetzt nicht noch eine schnelle Frage habt, dann ist jetzt wirklich Null und Schluss. Okay, danke euch. <lacht>